Thanks for listening to Fluff and Crunch, where we talk about the connection and sometimes disconnect between system, setting, and story in tabletop RPGs. So I know you haven't done any gaming because it's been a day. Okay, unless you had a busy night with your family out of town and out of the country, I, actually. I, I painted. You painted. You painted minis or like painted a I wall? I painted minis. No, no, I painted minis. I was, I was, uh, I was, oh, he's disappearing. I was painting General Grievous and friends. Oh, well, that's cool. I painted Darth Vader. I have to be really careful. He has four lightsabers and they are all super fragile. That is not a good miniature to have on the table. <laughs> yeah, he's getting broken. <laughs> Uh, so no, I, I didn't do anything like that. I watched the TV show and went to bed. Um, but today, I'm interested in this. We're going to talk about the fluff and the crunch, or the fluff versus the crunch, or the fluff and the uh, uh, sacrifice. No, we're, just talk, the... we're just talking about the crunch. <laughs> oh, we are talking about the crunch. But but I think had... that, you know what though. I think fluff is always implied by the crunch and no, the crunch is no, always implied I'm, by the fluff. I'm loading Discord now so I can I think that I'm pretty sure that the request for this was very was. clear. That's true. It was very it was very, very clear. And tell us who the user is. That's what I'm looking up now. I'm trying okay, to find good. it. Uh, now interestingly, I, we did have a comment uh from last night on the uh very rap the really rapid reaction to the Star Trek Adventures release. Uh we did have a comment. Uh, someone asking which one of us is fluff and which one of us is crunch. And, well, I'm crunch and you're fluff. Then. Well, clearly, but I, I don't, but I don't think we ever like, like. No, this is shirts. yeah. Well, we never. Well, because we we don't think of it like that. The fluff no. and crunch was the name you came up with, and I yeah, agree yeah. with that. And it works for multiple things. Uh, it was a user called Chaps Weekend. I wouldn't mind hearing about the crunch side of fluff and crunch. Yep. What are the crunchiest, most rules dense games that are still decent or playable? Oh. Where is the line between role playing and pure simulation? There's nothing there at Fluff Talk. Now, it's an interesting point there. What it was asking for is what is the crunchiest game that's still good? That's now, a really good question. It's difficult to do that because I haven't played every single game ever. And let's, I'm just going to run through some of the things that people suggested. Now, virtually everything of single pit things people suggested, what they did, a lot of people were suggesting the classic. Here is a really bad, overly crunchy game right. that no one plays. Well, straight away then, that's not a good game. Um, so a couple of people suggested GURPS. I have never played GURPS. I Neither have right. looked at the odd book, and mostly I am put off because I looked at some books when I was at uni. So we're talking, what, early, early, yeah, early 90s, mid-90s. Back when like you that. were still listening to Oasis. No, I, no, I hate Oasis. <laughs> never mind. They are, my, they are my most hated band in existence. <laughs> I'd rather listen to Coldplay. I don't know, some teeny. Yeah, Coldplay's like next. I'd rather listen to um, <laughs> you know, some boy band than Hanson. the way I. Uh... No, All right, sorry, sorry for, sorry for uh, sidetracking. Stroke. Anyway, we're totally off. So, a couple of people suggested GURPS. I, yeah, I've never played it. I remember looking at a book in the nineties. Um, and thinking there's some good ideas in here, but the rule system seems overly obtuse. Uh, I remember looking at it again sort of 10 years ago, uh, and it's still looking the same. And worse, yeah. the books still look like they were formatted the same. Now, yes. okay, yes, it is entirely possible to have a very well writ written set of rules that's not nicely typeset and doesn't have lots of fancy gra graphics and doesn't have lots of nice art. I'm sorry, I I'm a bit of a graphics whore. I like nice things. It's the same reason that I play brand new computer games and Yes, I'm sure some 16-bit games are really cool. But if a game looks like it's 20 years old, I'm probably not going to play it. Yeah, I, I, I want to play modern stuff. I and it's the same with like a book. I like color art. I am put off by black and white text. See, I, I'm sorry. So I, GURPS to me, just I've never really got into playing it because I'm put yeah. off by things I've heard, the little I've looked at it, and, and the books themselves. So I can't comment on that. I know a lot of people mentioned, and, and this was mentioned in the Discord, and I've and this is something that gets bandied about. I've heard this bandied about, especially gamers of a certain age, is the vaunted Phoenix Command, um, which is a a was uh, like a modern firearms, modern combat um, game, and I never played it, so I can't. All I have heard is that it is extraordinarily crunchy. I can't comment on that because that is entirely received knowledge without any kind of um, 
explanation to it. So I can't comment on on that at all. But I yeah. think going back to the original question, which I think is important, it's not like give us your crunch porn game game that's like horrible, you know, some kind of nightmare. I've got a few of those but that is really crunchy and playable. And then where is this line or this idea? Where would we see like the qualifiers for where do you tip from playable RPG into more of a, of a simulation because of the density of the rules? I think those are really interesting questions. So I'm gonna do my best to stay disciplined and stick, with, stick within those, those limits as yeah. we discuss this here. Um, Cause we've mentioned in a couple of the other ones the other big one that people often mention for a really crunchy game is hero slash champions because I yeah. think hero is a generic system and champions are the super yeah version. hero system and champions was the is the main one that uses again when I've tried to look at that it looks incredibly complex and I've never gone any further so I can't come with it yeah um, I, I don't subject... actually think that I have I know that I've never played it I've never played any version of champions or any hero system game and I know that I I haven't even looked through it so it's weird actually because I remember back in the the Back in the olden days, um, I remember seeing all these games on the shelves. You know, I remember, you know, the the, the original, the, the first golden age of RPGs, the 80s. I remember seeing all of these, but there were certain things that just, there were certain things I played, there were certain things I didn't play. And I was a, a elementary, middle, and high school student, and therefore did not have disposable income. Yeah. Uh, and didn't have, obviously, time on the planet to have collected a heap of stuff like I have now. So yeah, like role, I, I, I have played, um, I played the Middle Earth role-playing version of the role master system once um, at like an all night birthday party. We, we played Middle Earth. That's the only time I've ever played uh, the role master system. Um, so yeah, we can only comment on the things that we've played, but again, I'm going to keep my, I'm going to focus on that, which is playable, um, and crunchy. Just really quickly, while I should talk about yeah. Phoenix, you said Phoenix Command is a modern military thing. I played a game called Millennium's End, which I played quite a bit and it wasn't super crunchy, but the one thing that it did have was crazily crunchy was when you shot someone, you had these little pictures of like an outline of a, of a person or a person kneeling or a person mm -hmm. lying down. And you put an overlay over it with a percentage thing and you roll the dice. So <laughs> if you got an accurate shot, you hit exactly where you aimed. But if you missed, the shot would deviate to somewhere else around it. So like you might, you'd aim for the middle, you know, center mass, but you miss the center mass. You might fluke and hit somewhere else on their body, um, which made the game, you know, slow down a bit. But when we played that, we were playing that with Brian playing with oh, one of those really massive big Barrett, like M281 kind of rifle, the huge things. And he would be sit down in a mile away shooting people in an encampment. Yeah. Um, and it had rules for like, you know, the the bullet, the drop over that distance and wind and stuff. But because I was only really, I only really played that mostly with like one player. It was totally manageable. And when we did play it with three players, most of the party got killed because like something happened. So actually I have loads of good stories about that game. So it can't have been, that bad in play but it did have a yeah. that was one of the crunchiest things i'd played at that point um but there are three relatively crunchy games that i'm going to play on and in all accounts these are games which they are very crunchy lots of people say are too crunchy but i have had fun with yeah now whether it's that's in spite of the system or because of the system we'll we'll get to that yeah and there are a few that i'll i'll highlight too something i want to point out that you made me think of uh when we spoke actually yesterday is the, the idea of some systems are crunchy throughout when it comes to your experience with them. So in other words, if you're a GM, you have the planning phase, you have the at the table phase. If you're a player, you've got character creation and character management, and then you've got gameplay. And some games are really crunchy on both of those sides for GM and player. Some are yeah. crunchy for one versus the other, you know? Or maybe they're only really crunchy and potentially cumbersome or more challenging on one side of those. And, I, and there are a couple of games, one in particular that I can think of that is, it's, it's far more on one side. It's far more on the GM and far more on one side of that half than, than both. So I think that's an important um, distinction to make. So how, do, how shall we proceed? How would you like to proceed? Well, I've got three main games I'm going to talk about. Since you brought that up, I'm going to highlight a game the one directly above me, um, that I actually only think is crunchy in one sense. 
Okay. Okay. And this is so mutants and masterminds. I, I'm going to talk about third edition because it's the most recent one. First, well, I'll, I'll quickly do it. First edition mutant and mastermind was basically it was the D and D three point oh. Yep. Third edition, sorry. I played it. But I had so it was it. third edition. Um, they changed very little and just shoved superhero things. In. When they went to second edition, they tweaked it a little bit. Okay, trying to move it further away. By the time they got to third edition, it's quite a lot different to the sense that some of the stats now are no longer called the stats they were in D&D. The stats yeah. also now are just the modifiers. There's none of those kind of like, oh, I have an 18 strength, so that gives me a plus three modifier. Your strength is just your modifier. So, you know, Batman has a strength of four but he has a fighting ability of 14 that's insane those are just his modifiers to doing things um feats went they're now called advantages skills still exist uh and one of the big things that mutant master right back i think in first edition is that it doesn't have it doesn't have hit points you have a toughness role now actually mm -hmm. this is part of the, this is one of the two things i don't like about mutant master in play it's actually super quick you want to do something you roll a d20 you add your skill uh, you're either doing that against an opponent who has a defense stat or you're doing it against a difficulty number by the thing. And that's it. You succeed. Pretty if you're if you're trying to do damage, the person you hit then makes a toughness roll where they can they basically roll a dice, add their toughness and compare it to your damage value from yep. your thing. That's it. So in play, it's it's relatively quick. OK, there's a few extra, you know, extra things. The thing that makes it complicated is a lot of the advantages, which are basically feats. You have to know them. I mean, Batman, I can't even look at them. Batman must have like 20. There's no way I can, I, you know, and if I'm a GM and I'm trying to play Batman as a friend because the, the PCs are playing things, that's a problem. But over time, you would learn what all of those mean. So that's, I don't consider that to be a problem. The problem in Mutants and Mastermind is the character creation. Um, it's incredibly in-depth. Mm -hmm. I remember now, that. The reason it's incredibly in-depth is you can make anything and you can do crazy variations of stuff. So you can have a really bog standard character that's just, he's super strong, okay? And he has all these cool skills and that's it. And that's really easy, okay? So then that kind of character, but if you want a character that like, well, so like Batman's complicated because he has a utility belt. The idea is he can only use one thing from his utility belt at a time. So each of the things in his belt are like, and are in an array there are like yep. a sub thing um and you have powers that work differently depending on how you use them or you can use this power this power if you can transform it now you can create almost any kind of superhero and probably other genres in mutants and mastermind but that's the trade-off to be able to have that freedom to create amazing characters and do almost anything you probably can um it's super complex to do yep. it the kind of thing you do need a spreadsheet or, or you know you need a ton of calculations you can't there, there are probably people who because they've done it over years can do it really really quickly i mean i remember like when that was the advantage when i loved it when mutant uh, uh what's the marvel marvel heroic came out and it was so easy to go i'm going to yeah. take my dc heroes books and i can convert everything to this because this is super easy yeah um but but you know you can make super detailed characters that work exactly how you want yeah uh and that's the trade-off so that is a system, you know, in, so what you said, in play, it is not crunchy. It's mm -hmm. relatively, it flows very quicker. You know, it's on par with 5e, and it's probably easier to play in the safe Pathfinder. It's, you know, it's, it's relatively streamlined because they've worked on it over the years to make it. And this is still like a 10-year-old game. I mean, yeah, if it was a fourth edition, I imagine it would be even more um, streamlined. Well, but it's the all original in the version, creation. I mean, was like 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but where you then have a lot of legwork as a GM, because if you're the GM and you wanted to create your own bad guys, yep. that's a lot of work. And you have to have real system mastery as the GM because you need to know what all of the different talents and advantages and powers do. The players mm -hmm. don't. The players need to. It's one of those kind of games. The players just need to understand what the thing they're doing does. Yep. The GM needs to understand everything. everything. Um, so it's it's hard work for a GM. But I mean, I played, I don't know if I played third edition or second edition, but I played a campaign with my then partner and Brian and his then partner. And he said, these are two girls that literally knew nothing about role playing, mm -hmm. but we could play it. I mean, it, and it worked fine. And one of those, one of the people had like an ability to take on the powers of a different animal and they could just like add it out and that's changed all their power sets. And I just had to make those up. And it worked. So you can do really, really cool stuff with Muse and Masterminds. And I think that is the advantage of a crunchy system. You can mm -hmm. do, you know, and it, and it has a mechanical heft. Yeah, in a narrative system, you can do anything. But a lot of the time in a narrative system, anything you can do feels the same. 
Um, you That's, know, all of this stuff yeah. you can do feels different because there's rules behind it. The trade-off is that, yeah, it can be really difficult to do that. Um, so that's definitely an example of a system which it is complex um, compared to most superhero games we've seen in the last, you know, 10 years. It's way more complex than all of them. Um, but I, I mean, I still think it's worth it. Would I play it if I was going to play a superhero system? No, I always play whatever the Marvel thing is. And that doesn't have a license anymore. So I, I would play a. Uh, I would play Marvel Multiverse. And if I was going to play DC, I'd probably still play Marvel Multiverse um, because it's quicker and easier. I haven't got the time to spend half an hour creating every character. Yeah. And that would be a quick character. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, That's my you, first. You bring uh, up a couple of uh, really uh, like key points. And there's that, that, there's that differentiation. Like sometimes the mechanical burden, actually most of the time, most of the time the mechanical, let's just be honest, it's, it's on all, the GM. All the time. All the time. Okay, screw it. It's on the GM. Players be dumb. J players can be dumb as posts. They can just <laughs> stare at their character sheets and be like, that. And, and then you're like, okay, let me show you how to. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do an episode about dumb players. Some other, anyway. Um, uh, there's a question of, you know, sometimes is this, is the mechanical burden on the GM, is it evenly balanced between preparation which I, I would say would include character creation because the GM is probably going to oversee or maybe be a part of that, especially if it's group uh, character creation, or is it at the table during gameplay? And a, a game that, that I think of in, in this respect uh, is, is Traveler. Um, is Traveler in virtually all of its versions. Um, there are and I'm probably wrong, but there are two, how's this sound? I'm not wrong in saying this. There are two versions of Traveler yeah. that don't use a version of the, the 2D6 role, like the classic Traveler system. Mongoose Second Edition, Mega Traveler, all the versions from Game Designers Workshop, all the, the core mechanic is roll high 2D6 plus a couple of flat modifiers you know um static modifiers and you're trying to meet or beat a number okay that's the basic there are two versions there have been two versions of traveler that used a different a totally different mechanic i'm not talking about those um traveler is an interesting game in that it is actually in almost always really easy to run at the table however it can be very crunchy and involved when it comes to preparation and that's almost always on the GM, that game, almost. I mean, so um, star system creation, planet creation, um, sector creation, which is, a, and subsectors, those are areas of space. Um, there are rules and there, there, are, there are basic rules in the core rule book for how to do all those things. And they're quite involved. And then there are additional books that make them even more involved. If your characters are going to go to Star System X and you, based on how they're using their, their starship, they're going to jump into the system X far from the planet, there are tables where you're going to need to figure out, based on their <laughs> acceleration of their maneuver drive, how many hours it's going to take them to get to the main planet, to the starport. Like, there is, there is that degree of simulationist, and totally simulationist detail in Traveler. However, the vast majority of that can be done by the GM in advance to plan for and be ready for when the players say, oh, we're going to do this. You're just like, okay, that's going to take you this much time. Or you can just hand wave some of it. The vast majority of you know, Traveler, Traveler provides a massive amount of, of, like I said, just up to that edge of simulationist, um, like just heaps of numbers and stats and and tables to figure out, you know, how far something is away and how long it's going to take for communicate, all those kinds of things. But the vast majority of it can be done away from the table so that you're ready at the table where the game itself actually flows um, quickly. And actually character management is, um, is really simple, I think. I mean, you have your stats, your stats have bonuses, uh, you have your skills. When you roll, you roll two die six. If you have a stat bonus, you add that. If you have a skill, you add that. That's it. So that's that's an interesting one where uh, I think it's entirely playable, 
but it's a game that requires from a GM an interest in and a commitment to, unless you want to just hand wave tons of stuff. And then I think there's a point at which it's like, well, are you really having the traveler experience if you as GM aren't willing to wade into those weeds and, and come up with and use the systems that have been created to build this, not plausible isn't the word, but like internally coherent universe of like, this is how things work. Um, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, Traveler's entirely playable, but, um, it takes a, it takes a committed GM who's willing to read the stuff. Big, big disparity between, unless you're asking players to make their own starships. Um, <laughs> but I mean, but that could be fun though, because it, that, that's a, that's a question of economics. You know, you're, you're looking at, okay, I only have enough money for a 200 ton space frame. And, and I'm going to, and I, if I want to make it go this fast in jump space, that's going to take up this much space, which is going to require this much fuel. And it becomes a, it becomes an issue of scarcity and economics where you're trying to figure out, well, I want my spaceship to do this, but I can't because I don't have the money or forget about money. If that even isn't an issue, the darn ship can only hold just so much stuff. So where am I going to cut corners? And I mean, that that's kind of fun. But yeah, for the most part, Traveler is, is super playable by players, easily playable by the, the GM at the table. But yeah, it definitely has a lot of um, heft to it uh, in the preparatory phases. What's your next that's playable? I'm going to leave the big one till last. So okay. which I answer is, I'm going to go with this one, Anima Beyond Fantasy. This okay. is a very little known Game. I've heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's the kind of thing you see people recommend it and then say it kind of out of print. Um, I think part of the problem with this is that it's it's a, it's not it's not traditionally English. It was a Spanish company that made it. Uh, it then got translated into English through Fancy Flight, which would now be Edge. Uh, but it was kind of always a bit weird in that like the Spanish were like three four years ahead of us. So they would have a book which we didn't get, but they got a second edition which we never had translated into English ever. Which people are still banging on about. Like, are we ever getting this English version? Uh, maybe. And you know, had a really niche audience. Um, it's essentially like a fantasy role playing game, but almost for the view of like people who are like like anime stuff because that it's very very open ended. So when you create your character, I mean, you have levels, but you create your character kind of like you do in Mutant Mastermind or something like Heroes, where you have 600 points to build your character from. And then you pick like a, a class, but all the class does is give you different costs for different things. So your main attributes will cost differently depending if you're like a more physical or a more wizard That's one. That's an interesting approach. Yeah, I mean, it's good because you can make a character more aimed to what you want. You can play a generalist who can be good at everything. And when I say everything, it has rules for sort of like sort of essentially martial arts superpowers, like key powers, call it. And there's separate subsystems and powers for being psychic. And there's separate powers for doing magic spells. And then there's another subsystem for doing summoning magic. Um, and then you can just have loads of like, you know, just be good at things, just have loads of skills on top of that. So it's really cool that you can make a character that you want, but the character creation is really horrendous. Okay, so so far it's the same as Muse as the Mastermind. Where this thing gets worse is the in-play. So this little table that I've got, where is it? It's here. It's this table, this table over here. Um, this is the table you use in combat. Now, it actually works well. It's just the fact that you have to have a copy of it. Um, this table is something like, I'm trying to work out how many columns it is. It's 10 columns. Which is not so bad. Ten columns on the table. I can cope with that. Um, but I think it's got about eighty rows on it because yeah, the top half. Of, there are a lot goes of from, intersections on that. It thing. goes from three hundred to zero, counting up in tens, and the bottom half goes from ten to four hundred, counting up in tens. So yeah, that's like seventy columns. And the idea is, when you roll to hit someone, you take the number that you rolled, whether you beat the defense or lost against the defense, compare it to this number. You then compare that to the armor of the person. That and then gives you a percentage. You then do that percentage damage of your standard damage thing. So you're having to look it up with this little table. Go, oh, you got really good. I do 180 percent. Then you've got to work out 180 percent of the damage you were meant to do. Now that's a bit rubbish, and I'm sure they could have done it better. What is cool on this table is when you get a negative roll, like um, so you roll and you miss, it gives a chance for the other person to counterattack. And this was the first time I think I'd ever played a system where if you do badly on an attack, 
the other person gets a chance to hit you back because you know i'd play D D. that never happens i'd play you know the world of what not world of warcraft world of darkness that was never a thing in that um i'd never seen a game where you know it was always i attack i missed this next person they attack they mean savage world same thing I, there's very very few systems out there where if you fail to attack that the other person gets an opportunity to counterattack. This was the first time I see it. That's now, clever. 2D, some versions of 2D20 does do that. Um, but this was the first time I saw it, but not even that, you know, it's a scaling counter. So if you really fluff your attack, um, the other person gets a really good opportunity to counterattack. Now, it didn't really need this table. You could probably just come up with a much more straightforward rule that removes that table completely and just has a straight, like a much easier way of doing it. But that's kind of what this game is like throughout. There are tables upon tables for combat modifiers. Um, if you do extra actions, what penalties you get. Oh, if you do extra actions, you also get a penalty to your defense and a penalty to your damage. And you can do called shots. And it's one of those things where it's like you said, it's very similar. Well, like our, our, our reader, viewer, whatever asked, it's very simulationist. So it's finding the character creation because you're trying to make this cool character you can do all this cool stuff. But then you disappear down a rabbit hole of modifiers and modifiers and tables and more modifiers. And you kind of think. So you're saying this is playable? Well, it was. Pl what I know is that when me and Scott played it, we had a lot of fun, but we didn't play it a long amount of time. And I bought a load more books for it, um, mostly because you could do it now. I think you would have to if you were going to play this seriously, you'd have to put some proper like, you know, system master into it. Where I think it'd be awkward is if you had a bunch of people and if you had some people that didn't want to put any effort into it and some people that did, I think it yeah, would be very work. difficult. You have to have people that are willing to like, you know, build their character with the GM, understand what they want, build this really kick-ass character. But in play, it was really fun. I mean, like the skill checks were fine. You're just rolling against a percentile, so it wasn't difficult. Um, and the combat let you do cool things because you could do multiple attacks um, and you could do, you know, these counter attacks. There was a lot of stuff I hadn't seen, you know, I think this was at a point where I'd played a lot of D&D &D where you, you get your attack or multiple attacks depending on your class and that's it. There's no counter attacks. Right. Okay? There's no like, I'm going to trade off my hitting. I'm going to try and do extra attacks where I'm going to hit less. You know, I mean, I remember reading Feng Shui, which made out that it was going to be the super amazing combat system, but you still only really did I hit because the system says, like, oh, encourage the players to do really cool stuff. But if you did cool stuff, it made it harder to do what you were trying to do. There was no incentive there. Yeah. Um, you know, exalted at least when you standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Exalted at least when you described your character doing something really cool, it gave you a benefit. Exalted ones yeah. that I should have talked about, but I'm not going into that because I've never okay. I've never really played it. But yeah, this I played a little bit. Um, and I did, we did really enjoy it, but I don't think we made the most complicated character ever. And making on the plus side, making monsters, I'm pretty sure didn't use the same rules as making um as making characters mm -hmm. which was good so at least you didn't have that thing of like ridiculously complicated um bad guys to mess around with but yeah so it's a game where it's essentially it is a game that needs a second edition gotcha and from what i've heard about the actual second edition it gets with a lot of the stuff they didn't need to concentrate was really good you know the character creation but i'll do loads of cool things is really good some of the ideas in combat and the fact that you know you can have a character that can do magic and combat if you want but maybe not be really good at both you could do that the fact that there are all these different subsystems um so you can do loads of cool stuff is really good the fact that they all work completely differently is is, yeah, is not very bad. good yeah. um but yeah there's good ideas in it and we played it and we managed but uh it could be so much easier definitely could I'm going to throw out something that you you know you and I have have talked about, but I think for those listening, this is definitely a, a worth considering thing. Is that there is always a trade off. Sometimes highly narrative systems or systems that claim to be highly narrative or really simple and streamlined, everything turns out to be the same yeah. because there aren't there isn't nuance, there isn't texture, um, there isn't variability. I mean, I, I've found that, um, and I've said this with uh, well, plenty of systems. I mean, just, I mean, gumshoe to an extent, a lot of things feel the same mechanically. Um, 
I I still think that by and well, I mean, I remember fourth edition D and D. Like every class at first level got a D eight damage something. You know, it just yeah. behind once you take away the 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 one sentence descriptor, it's really exactly the same. Um, but on the other hand, when you want to account for those kinds of things, you have to put in more layers, which yeah. adds complexity. That's just a that's just a trade off. Um, I, I'll throw this one out there as again a a playable. I think you got right up to the edge of playable with Anima. No, I there. think no. I think it might definitely it's it's probably teetering over that edge. I think you have to be careful and picky and choosy about how you're right. going to play it and what you're going to allow. Like I said, actually, from a GM point of view, the the monsters are much much easier to play. Hmm. It's the characters character. that are insane, which is a nice change. Yeah. I'll throw yeah. out a, a, a complex, crunchy game. Actually, not necessarily complex, but definitely crunchy. I mean, I think when crunch becomes complex is when you just pointed this out with Anima, where you, you have multiple detailed systems and they're all different. Like, that's horrid. Yeah. But here's a game that is, that is very crunchy, um, I think is very playable, and I don't think is actually overly complex it's it's modifius is 2d20 conan conan has a lot of layers to it there are a yeah. lot of moving parts there's a lot of variability the whole idea of reach That's what i was you're supposed say, to reach. It, it reach is like the one thing that everyone i know who runs conan like ignores or they forget rather i forget it i, I didn't last time and i have to say it actually made the game play yeah. better because it, it makes is. a genuine difference between whether you've got a spear or a sword yeah. or a little dagger that playoff between, you know, you start off the person with the spear has the advantage, but if you can get inside yeah. that, then now you, the dagger you have an advantage and they have a dis and yeah, that makes so I, sense. Now I really brought, like once I realized it. They brought that back with Cohors Cthulhu, from what I understand, which I don't have anything to do with otherwise. But Conan, you think about it, you have you have mental attacks. Yeah. You have the you have displays, Woo. you have ranged, you have melee, you have a lot of different effects. Yeah. Um, and there are magic there's magic magic although magic is the one part of the sorcery sorry sorcery sorry, is the one sorcery. part of the system yeah. that i'll point out as being well in typical modifius fashion it's it's not well explained and so it's hard to get your head right you, there's a lot of house ruling and just decisions of this is how we're going to do this at our table that's life but yeah conan 2d20 is was whatever you want to call it because it's not in production anymore a um a system with a lot of moving bits and parts it's one of the few games that i would insist unless someone really wants to wade through books you use the digital um, character generator which you can still find online use that um instead of wading through all these books to try to make a character because and there, there are some funky things about character creation about um how you shift points around between your attributes and things like that um that seem a little bit to me even now after i've played it a bunch and run it a bunch it seem a little like odd and not necessary but the difference though with conan 2d20 as opposed to something like this anima thing you just talked about is that the system is in it's 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 coherent Yes. It's 2D20. Yeah. And so every question you have to answer with the dice, the same, you go through the same process yeah. and you, you, you draw from the same types of variables. So Conan, I mean, if, if I know that, you know, it's, it's hard to find, um, you, you, you've got to find it on the secondary market or the <clears throat> secondary digital market. <clears throat> um, <laughs> it's, subtle. Anyway, um, <laughs> But if you enjoy a game with a lot of um, tactical options, a lot of really detailed options for combat, um, but you also want to have a uh, like a, a more of a as you and I you know cinematic flexible side you know to instead of like I'm 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 wedded to a grid, yeah, like fourth edition was you know this is this yeah, uses uh, narrative zones. But um, but yeah, if you want a lot of different variables in combat and and figuring out ways to like synergize between these different kinds of things, 
Conan has got a ton of great options yeah. that all operate within a coherent system. So I think Conan is entirely playable, but um, as it's an older 2D20 system, definitely like way out there on the extreme of the, in the crunchosphere um, for that overall system. I mean, for 2D20 play. games, yeah. I, I, I have said repeatedly that I prefer that end of the 2d20 thing to me it's a shame i mean maybe it's part of the reason i kind of quite like fallout because fallout was the first one that felt like it was trying to move back towards that end. yeah or it like um, stood pat having we've, obviously we've only got one game that has a second edition seeing what happened to star trek i can imagine if they'd kept the license for conan and done a conan second edition conan would have become more like acton cthulhu i feel like cohorts cthulhu almost is you know conan second edition i think that would be a shame because i actually I think you would lose something. I think you would take out a few too many rules and a few things that actually makes Conan out things. Like Infinity. Infinity maybe has a few rules that aren't that classic. We've already said it a bunch of times. Not well explained. But the hacking system is really, really good. It's an awesome hacking system. Yeah, it is. Just not well explained. When you work it out, it's it's really cool. You know, we've played it and it was great. And I love Infinity. And I think if I lost some of the, the crunchiness of Infinity and there was an Infinity second edition, well, it wouldn't be as good. It's yeah. just flat out. You know, Fallout is Fallout's great because it's a little bit crunchy than Star Trek. I don't mind Star Trek not being crunchy because Star Trek doesn't need to be. It's not about the combat. Right. Acting Cthulhu to me sometimes is a bit too on the, you know, you can make a bunch of players and they all seem very, very similar. You have to basically yeah. make someone a magic character to make them to differentiate well, you know it, it's like this so it's... why does an mp3 not sound as good as a full cd quality version of the same song or a vinyl version of the same song because it's one tenth the size you had to squeeze something out you had to buff the edges you lose the texture and there's just there's just no way around that so yeah i i, I agree i Fallout is probably the crunchiest of the actively supported 2D20 games, although Infinity is still alive, but I don't know the extent to which yeah. it's supported. I mean, I guess it's we know there. Infinity is still alive when it gets another book. It's just, yeah, it's a good point. It it's there. Um, I need to go back and play Infinity. I feel like I've been saying that for about three years. You have. Yeah. Okay. And... Um, so I've hit Conan. So you said Conan. I did. So you've hit Mutants and Masterminds and Anima. And I'm I'm guessing that that other thing is lurking, uh, and you're going to talk about right. it. Right. Well, remember, this is why we are talking about crunch because yes. you don't like Shadowrun because of the fluff. That's correct. You are you are wrong. Um, no. Anyone who has read or played Shadowrun knows actually. So you got to remember what, how is Shadowrun managed to get to a sixth, and it will be seventh for how has Shadowrun got more editions? Oh yeah, there are plenty of people who like D &D. it. There they, are a lot of people because... who like Taylor Swift too. Yeah, but it's because of the fluff. Loads of people like Shadowrun because yeah. of the fluff. They like yeah, the universe. Totally. Loads of people I like the I've heard nobody talk about stuff. how they love the system. You're right. No, exactly. People, you know, the people like the 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 mix of uh you know, of cyberpunk and well, yeah, actually cyberpunk is proper cyberpunk as well because you are fighting against the man usually. So, uh, yeah, cyberpunk and the hacking and all of the stuff that goes yep. for cyberpunk with with magic and elves and dwarves and All right, and get dragons. to it, damn it. Yeah, I'm just making the point. You don't like it because of the fluff, and we're yeah, totally. doing crunch. Um, yeah, if you ask, if you ask six Shadowrun fans what their favorite edition of Shadowrun is, you will probably get six different. Oh, sorry, seven technically. Um, I'm ignoring Shadowrun Anarchy. Shadowrun Anarchy is an attempt at a narrative version of Shadowrun that um, somehow managed to be neither simple in so terms of a proper narrative game nor effective at being an easier it's just it's a complete balls up they met they completely dropped the ball on that. so really i'm ignoring that um i'm really talking about i'm going to talk about fifth edition okay so first first second and third i've looked at i've never really played a lot uh and so i can't really comment on them okay fourth edition they kind of rebooted the system quite a lot mm -hmm. and fifth and edition is a it has some things in it to change how certain things there were some problems in fourth apparently so they did things in fifth i think a lot of people would actually say fourth is the better version because the things they did in fifth to fix the problems in fourth people didn't like sixth they then did things to fix the problems in fourth and fifth and made an even worse job technically it's easier right why why is shadow one so complicated um i will read you 
straight out of the book. And it, oh, an example, hey, get this though, at least it has examples. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, just to get an idea, like for start, making characters is horrible because, I mean, it has to be. You have to, you can have a character that's really well skilled. You can have a character that's got really good physical attributes. You can have a character that can do magic, that has loads of money so they can buy all the guns, that has loads of cyberware, that has, um, I can't remember what I've said now, you know, they can do summoning because they're so kind of the other two games, same thing. because your characters can do so many different things. Obviously, yeah. character creation is a pain. Actually, yeah. I would argue that character creation is easier than both of these other two, because the way you do it, you kind of say, well, I'm going to you, you in the decent versions. Anyway, you prioritize, right, I'm going to have skills is going to be my big thing. Attributes, my second money is my third. I'm not going to be able to do magic at all. And I'm going to be a human. So that's a species thing. So you have this priority table thing which then gives you different amounts of points to spend in different areas. And it actually makes it a bit more manageable. It's definitely in, in fifth and sixth. Fifth is horribly complex. So yes, character creation is quite in depth. When you come down to it, you are just, you have a bunch of stats, which are generally D6 dice pulls. So if yeah. you need to do something, you're rolling stat plus skill with a load of D6. You're rolling a crap ton of, of D6. Yeah, like properly. You're rolling like, if you know, if you're doing it correctly, you're rolling 20 plus dice. <laughs> um, I, that is one of the reasons people do like shadow run okay now some people will be like if you're rolling more than 10 dice that game's dumb i am one of those people that are like no no i am quite happy rolling 20 dice you know i play warhammer where me and brian have to roll 20 30 dice yeah. in in and one you're go fine with that and we're fine with that so i don't mind playing a role playing game where i have to get 25 dice and roll all of them um because you know i'm probably only counting fives and sixes when you start going through the combat section and you get to the actions and you realize the combat actions has simple at free actions, but there's eight of them, simple actions. Well, there's 20 simple actions, complex actions. Well, there's another sort of 10, 15 of them. Let, let, let me stop you. Let me, let me stop you here. Are, is is, it, is it complicated because it's hard because there are so many options you're buried in so many options yes. or is the adjudication of things itself complicated? Like, you, you know, I, I, I'll just jump in with this really quickly. I, one of the things that to me makes a game like crunchy to the point where it, the more steps, the stupider it is, is the more steps it takes to resolve a question. Like, yeah, well, you have this modifier and then you have to go to this table and the table gives you a number and then that's your modifier. And, you, you know, again, yeah, it's luckily, like the DMV. I, luckily, it's not that. Like when that it, or what? No, when it comes to combat, I'll, I'll read you an example of combat, which actually, if you break it down into its steps, it's no worse than, it's not really any worse than 2D20. Okay. Realistically. All right, so the guy's doing an attack, uh, blah, 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 modifies his attack, turn out and cut his favor and give him a plus one dice pool bonus. Now, this is the kind of game that we're kind of like various versions of D&D. There are a lot of modifiers, but realistically, there will be the modifiers you already have built in because, you know, you're a cyborg and you have a sight. And that. You'll already have that on your character sheet. So you don't have to worry about them because you'll have them written on your character sheet. You'll have the situational modifiers, but you would learn them pretty quickly or you'd have, a, you know, it's kind of, what we've said when we play 2D20, you will have a sheet in front of you with like momentum spends. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, and a couple of For other sure. things like what do the effects and qualities do? You could get away with a sheet of paper that does everything a player needs to do. Uh, all right. Cutter rolls unarmed combat four plus specialization cyber implant weaponry two plus agility four plus modify one for a total of 11 dice. You would have three of those already on your character sheet. You'd already know you were rolling okay. 10 of those. Um, and you rather now this is the thing that then made fifth edition. But crap. He uses his physical limit for the test, which is six. What the hell? Essentially, Paul's got so big, they put limits on how many dice you can roll. And that's the rule that no one liked, which is why fourth edition might be better. He rolls and he gets eight hits. So he's rolled a bunch of dice. He's got eight things. Um the other person is now on the defensive and gets his free defense test. The modifiers come out to minus one. He rolls the things he needs to roll. He rolls six dice and gets two hits. All right. So the first guy has four more hits than the other guy. So he succeeds. Okay. That, you know, it's just like kind of like 2d20. Um, then luckily you get a set damage value. It says uh, the base DV is strength plus one. He has a strength of three. So the base DV is four plus four for the net hits is a total of eight. That's straightforward. You've taken the how many hits you got or how many net hits you got and you've added it to the damage value of the weapon. You don't have to roll, luckily. What then does happen is the person being hit has to roll for their armor. They roll dice and they take that away. It doesn't actually have any more dice rolling than 2d20 or most games. There is an attack roll. There's a defense roll. You compare. And then there is a 
then there's a there's a damage roll. The damage roll here, though, is for some reason you roll for the armor to reduce the damage rather than rolling the damage and taking away the thing. So there's no more dice rolling there than you're seeing in 2d20, other than the sheer quantity of the dice. Yeah. But the, there are just yeah, so the, many yeah, little exactly. modifiers. The quantity of dice in each roll. Yeah. And then the other the thing that then really makes it horrible is that, yeah, but if you've got a, if you've got a hacker who's in the matrix, there's a, there is a different subsystem for that. Uh, and if you've got a rigger who controls vehicles, then that works differently. Okay, and that, so, and that's, a, that's which, an issue, obviously. Which is why, Again. yeah, which is why lots of people when they play Shadowrun go right. When no one, no one be a hacker. If anyone, if we need someone to make, we'll use an NPC. You, know, you just have an NPC do yeah. it. Um, and you know, you you find ways of getting around some of the horrible stuff, so you can concentrate on all the cool stuff. It, it's one of those games when I've played, I've gone right. Let's just ignore some of the more left field modifiers, and, it, and it's easy to just kind of. We're just going to ignore so it. It's what you do words, with a lot so, of crunchy systems. So there you are, ignore some of it and it's fine. There are there are elements of the game, call them like modules or silos of the of the rules that you can get away from. You're not yes. stuck with them. It's no, not like yeah. Like uh, uh, I was looking through, I mentioned yesterday that game Time Lords, a time travel game from the 80s from this really minor uh, gaming company. And I was reading over the rules again this morning, not because I wanted to talk about it, but I was just curious, like, how does this, I don't remember. I mean, it's been a long time since, a really long time since I played the game. And it has this nightmare of a universal modifier table where every single modifier, you like, if, oh, it's plus three. Well, now I have to go translate because your stat is whatever it is. I have to go take that plus three and modify that for you. But his stat is 17. So I have to modify it differently for him. Again, these multiple steps yeah. to answer a single question. That to me is where the crunch gets into stupidity and, and like the attempt at simulation. That's usually, I think, where crunch goes nuts is when the authors are trying so hard to make it realistic that they end up making it too cumbersome to, to yeah. function. It's like we said in, in Conan, if I was running Conan, I would probably, there would be times where I'd say, well, let's just, let's not have a PC sorcerer. Oh, definitely let's, not. Let's leave sorceries for NPCs, then we just don't have to worry about it until we have an NPC sorcerer who's a bad guy. Well, and we can worry about it. And, and even then, you know, you as GM can just surf over those rules. Look at the, because yeah. there's so many different, I mean, sorcery is a category. It's, it's, there's so many different things that fall under that in Conan. You could just decide on your own, like, you know, the players don't have to know what rules I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to keep myself honest by spending some threat periodically and say, this happens. Hey, that person, your, your patron suddenly like, all the blood sprays out of his eyeballs and he drops dead next to you. And so you just spend a couple of threat and, you know, Rogdar the sorcerer runs out of the room. Do you actually have to have a rule and a yeah. power behind it? No, no one's yeah. ever going to know the difference. No. I mean, that's the thing. So, I mean, part of the thing around it. One of the things that can be fun about Shadowrun is all of the cool little things you can do. You can have a character just really skilled, or you can go in really into your gear pawn and have loads of cool weapons, which all have loads of modifiers, or you can be one of these martial adults that does cool martial arts stuff, or you can do magic. And they have all got slightly different rules, but by having slightly different rules, it means they are working more to how they're meant to work. Yeah. The, one of the problems with the the narrative version, the anarchy thing, is that almost everything you could do was just was just extra dice. Yeah. Oh, I'm a martial adept. I get extra dice to hit. Oh, I've got a big gun. I do extra I do extra dice when I attack. And everything just felt the same. Mm -hmm. There was no real it meant that, you know, yeah, it, it didn't make any difference. And it took money out of the game as well. You got paid in like karma or something. So it it just didn't make as much yeah. sense. One of the things in Shadow, you know, you will get paid in XP. So you can skill up, but you also get paid in money. Right. Well, I can spend Which that is on then within gear. the world itself. Yeah. And so then that it it makes more sense that you can actually know I'm going to buy better gear and buying better gear. Then you had choices. Do you go for the really expensive cyberware, which takes up less of like the amount of cyberware you're allowed to have? Yeah. Or do you go for the really crap cyberware, but then you can't have much of it? You can only do that kind of stuff in a really detailed right. system. Now, yes, there are 100 percent points where. You know, they they they've made mistakes in the system. Like the idea they put this limits in to stop you rolling too many dice, but then kind of messed up other things. There probably are too many modifiers, but it's trying to find that sweet spot of, well, if we don't have enough modifiers, everything feels the same. Yeah. And this gun is the same as that gun. Or we have too many modifiers and well, now it's just too complicated. So I trying to find that sweet this. spot is difficult. I ran into this and I, I can see where this happens. I can see where mission creep in terms of rules writing happens. 
hmm. because I experienced this when I was writing Eris. I wanted to keep Eris somewhere between Octum Cthulhu and Conan. You know, that's where I wanted to put it in general. And I remember when I, when I wrote the first version, a draft of the first version, I realized unintentionally that I got into the mode where I was starting to write rules for everything. It becomes very easy. You write a rule for one thing and then you think, well, there's some other thing that's analogous to that, or there's some other question that structurally is similar to, so I'm, I've got to write a rule for that. I got to write a rule for that. And then you, I, I remember I felt kind of cheap when at a point I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to write this thing and say, hey, basically everything else in the game is based off this core mechanic. And yeah. then here are some ideas about how to deal with it in different situations, but I'm not trying to answer all questions. I actually felt like I was being cheap to the purchaser. Like I'm not answering all your questions, but I don't think that, I don't think that you, you should do that. I am um, back to our, our original point or one of our original points is there is no sweet spot. It's it's because so much of it is personal preference. But yes. there, there's always going to be the trade off between simplicity, which comes at the price. You you gain simpl simplicity by giving up texture. Yeah. But when you gain texture, you are going to lose simplicity. And so then the question is, how much are you as a GM willing to invest time and thought into this? And also, will you get players who meet you there? Because the more textured the system, the more it asks of everybody at the table. And if you have lazy players, then it can get really frustrating. And, and, but then on the, on the other hand, if you just have a really simple system, then everything is vanilla. Well, e even some some relatively crunchy systems can boil down to that. That's why I like systems as options. I mean, that's why it's funny when I've gone on Reddit at times, I, go, I want a system that can do this, 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 and this, but it's also simple. And people are always like, well, that doesn't exist. And it's like, you know, the reality is, yeah, you, you can't, if you want options, whether that's in yeah. character creation or, or combat or in playing the game, if you want options and, and variety and texture, like you said, the game is going to be more complicated and it's not going to be as quick. But you're absolutely right. It does depend a lot on it's a lot of its personal preference. Sure like me and my players can cope with a much higher level of crunch um, than some other people can. Like I said, you know, just looking at 2D20, some people look at, well, you, you've you given Conan as an example of like the upper end of, you know, crunchy things. I, you know, Conan to me is fine. Yeah. Um, I yeah. could go, you know, a little bit beyond, I could go beyond Conan, but I, I'd only want to go, go beyond Conan in terms of crunch if it was giving me something back. Yeah. Now, something like Shadowrun is probably going to, there's too many modifiers, but I can just ignore them. Yeah. I don't have to. And look at this table here, environmental modifiers. And it's exactly what you said. In 2D20, that would just be an increase in difficulty by one or two. And you'd make a judgment call. This has got like a whole table yeah. with a whole bunch of different numbers. It's but just again, not necessary. You can, it, it's like if your car stereo is really complicated but you can get it to play the music you want it to play. You're like, I'm just not going to fart around with those other pieces and parts. If the, if doing the core activity of the system is constantly complex, that's a, that's a problem. That's when things get stupid. So yeah, always yeah. a trade-off, no sweet spot, totally personal. Got to make sure the GM and players are on the same page. How's that? Yeah, I'm, de I'm definitely glad we've moved away from the kind of games where you looked up tables like you mentioned, which unfortunately yeah. Torg still does. But yeah, any any game where to do anything, you have to roll and then look at a table and the table gives you a modifier. No, no. just just roll some dice. No. Don't, roll some dice you know and the what, dice again, tell you. Don't, don't ask, don't give me a number. And then based on that number, ask me to translate it into a different number, which then I go back and use. Just get yeah. me there. Yeah. Get me there. Yeah. All right. There it is. The fluff and the crunch. They operate in tension. But uh, but we need them both. Yeah. Now I can play the crunch without the fluff. But that's miniatures games. No, that's exactly. not true. I, I still have fluff in my miniatures games that's, because but, but, I'm playing know, narrative ones. That's the wonderful thing about, about games is that there are umpteen million different games that you get a different experience out of. And a yeah. war game is going to give you a, you know, like a, a old, like, you know, cardboard chits. War game is a different kind of experience, like at the strategy, strategic level, than like a crunchy tactical, like playing um, um, battle tech. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Know what you want and go after it. Don't try to make something do something it's not built to do. There we go. So we hope that was uh, 
a reasonably crunchy talk about crunch for the people yes. who ask for it. Yes. Uh, I enjoy talking about it. Me too. And uh, there we go. Don't forget to what like, subscribe, subscribe comment. Join the conversation. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends. Yeah, um, give us feedback. This whole episode is proof that we do actually read the Discord and we will accept suggestions. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Buy our merch. <laughs> oh, you have merch. Yeah, sorry. I don't. I don't. Give our I have a game I wrote. Merch. No, there, there are yeah. no collapsible drinking mugs. There are no keychains. There are no branded highlighters. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you, as always, for listening to Fluff and Crunch. You can join our Discord, you can subscribe to the podcast, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, all through the links in the show notes. Thanks again, have a great day, we look forward to talking with you.